welcome to probabilistic machine learning lecture number 22. We have momentarily departed from our ongoing uh, extended research or programming modeling example to um, look at a slightly different type of model which will lead us as a detour to a new tool that we can then use again in our topic model example. That model class is one for clustering and it'll lead us today to the concept concept of mixture models the algorithm we began with is a clustering algorithm called k-means that was arguably invented by hugo steinhaus in the early 20th century and it's an iterative process that iterates uh, that uh, creates a clustering on a data set that consists of samples xi by iterating between two uh, different algorithmic steps, one of which is to compute for a set of k means the distance to every single data point and assigning each mean a responsibility for this data point if it is the closest mean to that data point. And then as the second step, updating the location of these means by computing the means over the data points that are assigned to them. We saw in the last lecture that while this algorithm works relatively well, on simple data sets like this one, it has a few pathologies. In particular, it has no way of setting, at least out of the box, the number of clusters, K, and it doesn't work particularly well when the data set has a structure that, although evidently containing clusters, um, has a certain shape to the clusters. If the clusters are imbalanced, so one is very broad and wide and the other one is narrow and small, or if the clusters are extended as in the, I have a spatial extension as in this example over here. So we um, like use this as a motivation to start and think about how to improve this situation, how to fix it. And on that way, we looked at the way that it's classically shown that this algorithm converges. This is due to um, the existence of a Lyapunov function, which shows that this algorithm, k-means, even though not phrased in this way, can actually be thought of as minimizing an empirical risk. And we saw at the end of the last lecture that this risk function that uh, k-means is minimizing can be uh, written as a sum over not weighted, but selected square distances for uh, across the clusters for all the points um, relative to the cluster means that they are assigned to. We ended the last lecture by observing this and using this as a starting point to say what would be a probabilistic interpretation of this algorithm. We do this, of course, because we are in a class on probabilistic machine learning, so it's natural to ask what the probabilistic interpretation of such a classic algorithm is, but also with the insight that probabilistic modeling can help us understand and fix algorithms. This is a broader insight that doesn't just apply to k-means. It's actually a very frequent occurrence that if an algorithm has pathologies and you'd like to fix it, at least in machine learning, it, is, can, it can be useful not just to do an asymptotic analysis, but also to try and understand what, it, what its implicit assumptions would be if we were interpreting it as a probabilistic algorithm. And that's what we're going to do now. So how do we construct a probabilistic interpretation of a machine learning algorithm that is currently available to us in the form of an empirical risk minimization problem? Well, this is actually a generic kind of recipe. And if you followed along some of the analogous arguments earlier on in the lecture course, you may already guess how this works. We have been given a risk function that the algorithm is minimizing. I'll write that down somewhere. That, so the algorithm that we're, that we're looking for is finding a choice of vectors R and M, or actually a matrix R if you like, and M, that minimizes this loss function. And now what we can do is, it's actually always the same trick minimizing a empirical risk often, not always, but often corresponds to maximizing a likelihood for the following reason. So if you're minimizing this function, then that's the same 
as maximizing minus this function, we can take the minus inside of the sum already. And in fact, it's the same as maximizing minus this function times a constant plus a constant, because that doesn't change the location of the minimum. It's a linear transformation. Linear transformations do not, they're monotonic, and so in particular, they do not change the location of a minimum. So we can multiply this whole thing by a conveniently chosen <laughs> uh, a set of numbers and parameters. So we could take this and multiply by mm, one half times a parameter that we might call sigma inverse squared. And you can maybe already guess why that is. Plus a constant, because shifting a function by a constant obviously doesn't change the location of the minimum. Now, we can also take actually more generally any monotonic transformation of this function and that's also not going to change the location of this maximum. So in particular we can take the exponential of this expression. That's the same and here we have to be a little bit careful using our notation as maximizing this expression. So I've taken the exponential of this, this sum over the individual data points then becomes a product, right, because the exponential of a sum is a product of exponentials. And this inner sum here, I've actually retained. Now, why am I allowed to do this? I am because this, these indices are IK, these responsibilities. Remember that those are binary variables. So in this sum here, there is only one term that is actually non-zero. So when we take the exponential of that, that's only one term in a product that is, that is not one, but something else. So we might as well just keep that sum. It's gonna have the same effect, right? It'll, it'll keep that one term that remains, that is the exponential of this expression inside. This constant turns now into multiplication with a constant and I've called that constant Z inverse. And now you can maybe see that what we have here, this expression that we have here, is actually of a, very com of a, of a form that we immediately recognize. I mean, maybe you already recognized it when I wrote it down up here. What we are maximizing, the likelihood we are maximizing here, is a product, so that's an IID model for every single datum over a sum over the responsibility, so there's only one term in here that is not zero, um, of a Gaussian likelihood for the individual observation xi at around a mean mi, so the, the interpretation of means is retained, with a Gaussian surrounding it, with a parameter that I've introduced to make it an explicit Gaussian distribution. And now we can immediately see the value of this kind of probabilistic interpretation, why it's useful to think about the algorithm in this way in addition to this minimization perspective. Because it tells us how some of those pathologies that we've previously identified arise. If you are maximizing this Gaussian likelihood, what, what K-means has essentially done is that we de we've decided only to maximize this likelihood in terms of the means. And we've ignored this second parameter, the, at least the scale, maybe even the shape of this Gaussian distribution. Now, interestingly, we can do that because the um, mean estimate for a set of assumed Gaussian random variables is simply a weighted sum. At least that's true for isotropically weighted Gaussians. So if there is uh, just a scalar matrix here this value sigma square, it's un not necessary to know this if all we care about is mi. Now, th that may seem like a convenient thing, but we already saw that we are paying a price for this by having an algorithm in the end that cannot adapt to the shape of the distribution because we don't, there's no way, there's no, no like we don't have an access to a parameter that has to go somewhere in here that tells us what the shape of this distribution is. But perhaps more importantly, we are also paying a price for just maximizing M and ignoring the fact that we are essentially maximizing this Gaussian representation for the clusters by not being able to draw from this representation, not being able to talk about what the clusters actually mean. If we think about k-means in this way, then we realize that we're building a model that implicitly assumes, can be thought of as assuming that the clusters have a Gaussian shape. It's actually possible to motivate k-means in a slightly more general form without an explicit Gaussian assumption, 
And this is often the case that probabilistic descriptions of algorithms introduce these new parameters that amount to seemingly additional assumptions about the algorithm. But actually, maybe it is good to think of this algorithm in this explicit way because it provides us with an intuition for how the algorithm is going to behave because it would behave the same if we make the Gaussian assumption. So what would be a better way to phrase this clustering algorithm now that we know what the probabilistic model is? Now that we see that the algorithm is maximizing this likelihood, maybe we can think about what we might like to change to address these pathologies that we have identified before. We can start with the perhaps simplest issue, this shape. Why do we, how, what, what can we do to ha allow this algorithm to take into account that each cluster could have a slightly different shape? Well, a simple thing to do, I mean, a, a very generic thing to do would be, a very general thing to do, or the almost universal thing to do, would be to change this, what's called the base measure, this Gaussian assumption. We could have another parameterization and say the, uh, the, the distribution of the cluster, so each cluster is a probability distribution, which could have a more general form. That doesn't have to be Gaussian necessarily. But maybe that's a bit strong already. It's a bit of a big step to take at this point in our, in our analysis. But a simple thing we could do is just allow for these Gaussian clusters to stay Gaussian, but to have a more general covariance function. Uh, sorry, covariance uh, matrix. A, a symmetric positive definite matrix called sigma. And the other thing that is maybe a bit displeasing about this model is that it makes this assumption that every single data point is in a hard fashion assigned to exactly one cluster. So that would amount as a generative model to some external force telling us that um, you're now going to draw this new cluster and I'll tell you exactly, sorry, you're now going to draw this new datum xi and I'll tell you exactly which cluster it belongs to. If we wanted to make this a bit more general, then we could say there is a probability distribution, a discrete distribution that randomly decides which cluster to draw from and it draws the responsibility, this binary variable, from a distribution. These two changes, so drawing responsibilities from a probability distribution and assigning a general Gaussian form with a general covariance matrix to the clusters, that this class of models is then called a Gaussian mixture model. They are models that are designed for data sets that look like this. This is a reproduction of an image um, that, again, comes from Chris Bishop's book and was made by Anne Kathleen Schalkamp. That um, construct models that say, if you look, if you think about a data set like this, if someone gives you a data set like this, then maybe visually you can immediately see that you could think of this data set as having been generated by drawing from Gaussian distributions, in this case, three different Gaussian distributions in three different colors, where each datum consists, or it was drawn from exactly one cluster, but the decision to draw from, from this particular cluster is itself given by a probability, the discrete dis this distribution that is being drawn from. So there is an underlying probability density under this model that is given by these three Gaussian distributions. These are called the base measures. And we draw from each of these clusters with a certain probability that's sum to one. In this case, probability 20% to draw from this cluster, 30 from this cluster, and 50 from this cluster. We can write in math such a probability distribution as this conditional uh, distribution. This is a generative model for the data that says every single datum is drawn. Oh, and there should be an I here. Let me just fix that. Bam, now it's correct. So this model written in math assumes that every single datum is drawn IID from this distribution. This distribution says that we draw a cluster by first drawing from a discrete distribution. represented by a vector pi with entries that lie between zero and one and sum to one. And then once we have the cluster identity, we draw the actual datum from a Gaussian distribution that has a parameter, uh, two parameters, a mean and a covariance matrix. So this is our 
idea for how to improve k-means by a explicitly representing what the clusters actually look like explicitly so they are gaussian explicitly representing the process of assigning clusters with a discrete distribution and improving the representation of the clusters by allowing for a general shape variable so why isn't this an algorithm in the first place why don't we just do bayesian inference on a model like this so let's maybe try whether we can come up with a proper fully bayesian algorithm directly to replace k-means bayesian inference on what's called a gaussian mixture model so to do that we can write down a graphical model corresponding to or to understand whether that's possible or not we can write down the, the graphical model that corresponds to this representation so we write down a um a, a variable node for every single parameter of this model for all the means all the var variances covariances and the vector of probabilities for the clusters we could also put this into this uh, plate with k copies but then we would have to put a constraint that they sum to one so i'll just write it like this and um even just from this simple graph we can already read off without doing more advanced math that or we can get gain an insight for why it's hard to do bayesian inference in a model like this so why because well to put it quite simply you can clearly see that this graph contains a collider so these variables all have arrows pointing inwards so when we condition on the data that we get to see then those parents of these variables will become interdependent on each other this is explaining away all over again so another way of saying this is that if we wanted to do bayesian inference even if you had a convenient prior on um, the mixture components mu and sigma the parameters of the mixture components and the weights of the mixture components pi then after multiplying with this likelihood we would get a complicated fully interdependent joint probability distribution that doesn't have an obvious conditional independent structure in a, a, our previous work with the uh, topic model we saw that sometimes you can get conditional independence even in such situations if you're lucky because you this likelihood might turn out to be an exponential family for which we can find a conjugate prior but in this case it's clear that we can't find a conjugate prior because this isn't an exponential family this a, it's a product over a sum of terms and exponentials so we can't hope to get rid of this sum by somehow putting it into an exponential right it's just not going to work because of this sum structure here so in general it'll be very hard to find a closed form solution an a, a, a family of priors such that when we multiply with this likelihood we just get out a tractable posterior and that maybe might explain why we have to deal with approximate inference algorithms like well that are of a, going to be of a similar nature to uh, k-means so in search of a probabilistic replacement for k-means we might do a similar thing or actually the same thing as k-means and do maximum likelihood find the maximum likelihood estimate for those parameters pi and mu and sigma and we've already realized that if we would have hard assignments if we would just put binary values here for pi and ignore sigma and just optimize for mu and assume that sigma is a scalar matrix then we would get back k-means so we've introduced these probabilities pi and the full covariance matrix sigma in an attempt to heal some problems of uh, k-means to make it more performant now let's see whether that has actually made our job harder whether we can still do maximum likelihood or whether we've uh, introduced actually a problem for ourselves so remember how we got here we took the loss function of uh, k-means took its exponential and then an affine transform and noticed that it has this sum over gaussian shape now let's see if we can go back and take the logarithm again and do the same thing again do maximum likelihood now the, the main key thing that has changed is that um, well apart from sigma that we've introduced previously pi were the responsibilities so or instead of pi we had responsibilities and those responsibilities were binary so they were all all zero except for one which was one 
And I used this as a little, for a little dirty trick, which was to drag the sum outside of the logarithm. Now, when we're going to go back and try the same thing again, so if you take the logarithm of this expression, that's not going to work anymore now that we have introduced this vector pi of um, pro the non-zero probabilities for every single cluster. So if you take the logarithm of our likelihood, the log likelihood will still get the sum over the individual data, but the, um, this other sum over entries in pi, we now have to keep inside of the logarithm. Because every single term in the sum now contains numbers that are non-zero in general. So if we now want to find the maximum likelihood solution, we have to be a little bit more careful and again, treat this as an optimization problem, compute gradients and see if you can set them to zero. And we'll notice that because of this sum, things get a little bit harder and we end up with an algorithm that takes a little bit more work, but actually in the end is still very analogous to k-means. So uh, if you take the gradient of this expression with respect to mu, then um, we can first remind ourselves of the form of a Gaussian PDF. So I've written this down here just for convenience sake so that we can stare at it while we do the derivations. Let's take the derivative of this expression with respect to a particular mu j, one of them. Then um, first of all, this sum remains because it, every single one of these terms in the sum contains a, a term in mu j. We get the derivative of the logarithm, so that gives us one over the impression expression inside of the logarithm. Then we, by the chain rule, take the inner derivative. So there's only one term in this sum where we get our mu j, that's this term. And if you take the derivative of that inner term with respect to mu j, then we realize that we have an exponential function where mu shows up. So the derivative of an exponential of something is the exponential of something times the inner derivative of the argument of the exponential. So that keeps out this term here around and the inner derivative of uh, this term in the exponential is the derivative of a quadratic function. Some of you might know, otherwise you can convince yourself by writing down element-wise the entries in this double sum here that this derivative of a quadratic form is similar to how the derivative of x squared is two times x. Here we get the two kind of in quote unquote comes down, so it cancels with the one half in front and we just get minus the mm, covariance matrix inverse, the precision matrix. There's an inverse here missing. Let me just fix that. And boop, here is our inverse. Well, actually, I, it's, it doesn't really matter. I mean, uh, it's correct now, but actually we'll get rid of this sigma inverse in a moment. We, what we're looking for is the root of this gradient. So the point where it's zero. Ooh, um, we can multiply from the left with sigma j, actually, to get rid of this expression. But that's not really the challenge in here. If you want to find this root, then our problem will be that mu j shows up both here and also in this expression, twice actually. So solving this for zero will be very tough because mu j shows up in an exponential in here several times. But we can do a little trick. We'll suspend this belief, this belief for a moment and just introduce a, an auxiliary variable called rji suggestively, you can guess that those are eventually going to become responsibilities, but we can just pretend for the moment that we know what these numbers are, rji, they're given by this expression, and then we can actually solve for mu. Because if you now multiply with sigma from the left, we have on um, a, an expression that is given by the sum over all i, rji times xi, minus, we can also get rid of the minus on the left hand side here, minus a sum over all i rji times mu j. So mu j can be taken out of this sum because it's the same term in every term in the sum. We can give a name to this sum over rji over i, let's call it capital RJ because it like has, it's like a val it's like the, uh, the row wise sum over this matrix r and then write down an explicit form for mu j. Mu j is given by 1 over capital RJ times the sum over i RJ i xi. So this is a weighted mean of xi where each xi gets weighted by these responsibilities. 
We can already guess what's going to happen here. We'll find these, we'll somehow find a way of setting those RJI, these responsibilities for the clusters, and then we'll set the means to these weighted responsibilities. And this will clearly be a, a variant of k-means, right? Instead of summing over in a hard fashion assigned uh, cluster members xi, every datum will now be in a soft fashion be a part of every cluster and we'll just sum over the weighted cluster memberships to get our weighted estimates for the mean. Can we do the same thing for sigma? Actually we can, but in the interest of time I will um, just throw a few matrix differential algebra identities at you and say we can do the same thing and correspond uh, correspondingly compute the derivative with respect to sigma. And then the expressions will be a little bit more complicated because sigma shows up two, in two different ways in the Gaussian and both of them are a bit complicated. Once it shows up in a um, determinant of which we even take the square root and then it, takes, uh, it shows up with an inverse inside of the argument of the exponential. So there, you can look up in books, or maybe you've learned in undergraduate calculus classes, that those functions of matrices also have derivatives that we can compute. In particular, the derivative of the determinant of sigma with respect to sigma is the determinant of sigma times sigma inverse. So if you take the derivative of mm, the determinant to minus one half with respect to sigma, we get the minus one half down times the derivative with respect uh, to the power of minus three half times the inner derivative, which is sigma times uh, sigma determinant times sigma inverse. So one um, power of this expression here cancels and we're left with minus one half times sigma to the minus one half times sigma inverse. And also um, you might be able to look up that the derivative of an, an inner form so V transpose for any vector V times sigma inverse times V with respect to sigma is given by minus sigma inverse times V V transpose times sigma inverse. And we can use these identities to do the corresponding derivative. So we um, take the derivative of this with respect to sigma. As before, we get a sum over the derivative of the log, which is the same expression as before, times the inner derivative of each expression. There is only one term in the sum where our sigma j shows up. It's um, the inner term where we have j here that will give us the, in, on, in one case, well, so now there's, there's this expression here contains sigma in two different ways. So we have to use the product rule maybe. In the first term, we take the derivative of the, um, of the exponential term, which gives us as before for the derivative of mu, a, you know, e to the x, with the derivative of e to the x with respect to x is e to the x times the inner derivative, which is, so we have here, this is the outer derivative and the inner derivative is this, the derivative of this quadratic form with respect to sigma, which is minus one half times sigma inverse times, you know, v, v transpose times sigma inverse minus the um, derivative of this expression with respect to sigma to the minus one half, which we just computed here. So that's um, minus one half times, the minus one half goes here in front, times the determinant of sigma to the one half power, which conveniently we already have in our expression here. So this all goes back to outside of the, of the brackets and we're left inside of these brackets with sigma j inverse. So now we have a similar situation to our uh, computation of mu beforehand to find the root of this expression. We again pretend that we have these auxiliary variables called rji, the responsibilities. Multiply this ex inner expression from the left and the right with sigma inverse, which we, to, which we, which we assume to exist. Then um, those two sigma inverses cancel and we're left with a sigma j here and we can solve and find that sigma j should be set to analogously to the uh, derivative for the mean, one over R, capital RJ, so the sum over RJI over I, times a similar expression as before, but here we don't just have a weighted sum over the XI, but instead a weighted sum over their quadratic distances. That's a 
sort of typical form for a maximum likelihood estimate for a covariance. So if we had these RJI, then we could estimate both mu and sigma. What about pi? Let's see if you can estimate pi as well. So here, the situation is actually quite similar, but there's an extra caveat, which is that the um, pi j, the weights are supposed to be elements of a, let me just go one slide forward, they're supposed to be um, probability distribution, so they should lie on the simplex. Their sum should be one. They should be non-zero values whose sum is one. So to put in that constraint, we introduce a Lagrange multiplier. In case you don't remember how constraint optimization with Laplanche, Lagrange multipliers works, um, well, okay, maybe you want to check your notes of your math or machine learning lecture if you've taken it, but let me give you the, like, the three minute waving my hands about explanation. We're trying to minimize some function. In our case, that's a log likelihood. And we also want that function to satisfy a constraint where we represent that constraint as another function such that the constraint is satisfied whenever that function has a particular value, let's say zero. So in our case, that's our sum over the sigma, uh, the pi j minus one, right? If that is zero, then the sum over pi j is one. So we want to find a point where, and that's the whole idea, the gradient of our objective function, the log likelihood, points in the same direction as the gradient of the constraint function. Because if that were not the case, so if the gradients were pointing in slightly different directions, then that means we could move along the equipotential lines of the constraints function so that we could move without changing the constraints function and simultaneously reduce the value of the objective function. And of course, we would do that because then we wouldn't be at a minimum. So the only point where we should stop our optimizer is a point where the two gradients are pointing in the same direction. Well, up to maybe a sign change. So they are parallel to each other. So they only differ by a scalar. And that's exactly what we're writing down. We want the gradient of our objective function to be a multiple of the, the uh, gradient of the constraint function. So if you take the gradient of this whole expression, um, then this should be zero. Now, um, so this gradient is supposed to apply to both of these terms here, right? Okay, so let's take those gradients. So if you take the gradient of our log likelihood with respect to pi, then again, we get the sum stays, we get one over this expression, as before, times the inner derivative. Now the inner derivative of this is really simple. It's just the entry, this, this Gaussian distribution for the particular um, uh, cluster J that we're trying to optimize for. And then for the second part, for the constraints function, well, we just get lambda times pi j. Sorry, lambda, right? Lambda times one at the entry j. Okay, this we want to be zero because we want these two gradients to point in the same direction. So one simple thing to do to get an expression we can work with is that we multiply from the left with pi j because then we see that we here get back our uh, expression that we've now come to know and love, our ij, the responsibilities, plus lambda times j. So now comes the part where we have to figure out what lambda is. So that's an extra piece of information that we have to get in using usually the constraint, the fact that the constraint is supposed to be satisfied. So if we think about what would happen to this expression, which is zero, if we sum over all of these terms over j, then every single sum here, so in, inside of each i, each term for i, right, when we sum over j, we get um, a sum over r, r i j over j. So if you look at this expression, um, well, let me go back one for the definition of r, r uh, j i, we see that if we sum over j, then we have the same sum in the numerator and the denominator, so we just get one. So here we have, if we sum over j, every single term in here has a one. And so the whole thing is just n, right? The total number of, of data points. And here, the sum over j, 
is exactly what you want to constrain on. It gives one, right? Because the sum of pi j is supposed to be one. So zero is supposed to be equal to n plus lambda, and therefore lambda has to be minus n. Oh, sorry, that should be a little n. Okay, so that means we now we can plug in our value for lambda, say it's minus n, and solve for pi j. Pi j is given by the sum over r i j over, over i, so that's rj, capital RJ, divided by n. Whew. So that was a lot of arithmetic. Um, let's not lose sight of the overall picture. Now, now we've actually found a way of optimizing our hyperparameters or our parameters, pi, mu, and sigma of this Gaussian mixture model, not in a closed form, but in an iterative process that will obviously remind us of um, k-means. Why is that? Well, okay, maybe let me close the loop. I haven't actually told you yet what we do with the rij, rji maybe. So with we, in all of these three update steps we just derived for mu and sigma and pi, we had to uh, pretend that we know what those variables r, j, i are. If we knew those, then we could set mu and sigma and pi. But notice that if we knew what mu and sigma and pi were, then we also know what r, j, i are, because they are completely determined by these expressions. So what we can do is we can iterate between those two, and that's exactly what k-means does. So we can uh, here write down an algorithm that gives an iterative maximization of the log likelihood for this Gaussian mixture model. And that algorithm, for reasons that will become clear in a moment, is called the EM algorithm. Um, it's already, it's maybe good to mention this now because we'll get to it in a moment. So we initialize the algorithm by setting the variables mu and maybe sigma and pi in an um, arbitrary fashion, similar to how we did this for, um, for EM, and then use those values to compute the responsibilities, Rij, according to our definition of what they are. Having set those responsibilities, we can then compute our estimates for mu and sigma and pi. We first use our, compute our helper variables, capital R, and then set mu and sigma and pi according to the rules that we just derived to the roots of the gradient at that point. There is a, um, actually the fact that we are setting pi here is a little bit superfluous because pi is essentially just a representation of the, uh, the values of r, i, j, r, j, i. Um, I'm, I'm obviously very uh, bad at keeping the order of the r, i, j, and r, j, i here. And um, so therefore, we actually basically don't have to keep track of an explicit representation for pi. We can just write it in terms of what the values for r, i, j are. Now, what is the connection of this algorithm to k-means? I mean, maybe you can already see it, right? Um, it's we're iterating between setting the responsibilities and then setting the estimates. But let's maybe make the connection, like to recall our connection, make it a bit more precise. So if we go back to the simplified assumption that the Gaussian distribution we're trying to fit doesn't have a full covariance, capital sigma, but instead it's an isomorphic um, or scalar covariance, then the connection to, um, to k-means, or maybe to a soft version of k-means, it's sometimes called soft k-means, that's a uh, construct from David Mackay's book, becomes a bit clearer. So then the um, rij, the responsibilities, are given by um, those ratios, which simplify a bit because these Gaussians all have the same normalization constants, so the normalization constants cancel out, and we are left with something like a uh, a softmax expression for the, uh, for the responsibilities, and we can make that softmax expression hard by setting uh, beta towards infinity, by right? setting the variance, so beta here shows up as beta inverse, if we set the uh, this beta to infinity, that means we're setting the variance of these Gaussians to zero, and we can we uh, get back the exact k-means algorithms because, th because then this assignment here is literally just set rij to whichever value along j in here 
maximizes um, is maximized or is well the, these values are all, all then all, all zero except for one that is exactly one so we can maybe like this is one first interesting takeaway we can identify k means very specifically as a maximum likelihood estimate of a Gaussian mixture model where the assumption the specific assumption is that the Gaussian components have not just an isotropic covariance, so they're not just scalar. No, they're actually point masses. They are concentrated at exactly one point with infinite precision. So that maybe also explains where the pathologies in k-means come from. It's not just that they're making a Gaussian assumption and an isotropic Gaussian assumption at that, which would explain why it doesn't work well with elongated clusters. No, they also really, in a hard fashion, by assigning hard responsibilities, R, binary variables, this algorithm actually assumes that the clusters are point masses. And that's maybe why it also can't deal with clusters of varying size, because there is no way of accounting for them. And it explains why there is no easy, straightforward way to take the original k-means and use it to sample additional data points, as use it as a generative model, because the underlying generative model is a point mass of Gaussians. Okay, fine. So now maybe we found a probabilistic interpretation of the k-means algorithm. Was that really worth all this time, an extra lecture on, uh, on, on this? Of course not. Where our goal is not to just talk about k-means, we wanted to find a particular structure that we can use elsewhere as well. An algorithmic trick that can be used in probabilistic generative models in which it is not straightforward to find a maximum likelihood expression in closed form. And this is this algorithm that I've already mentioned is called the EM algorithm. What we're going to do next is try and figure out where this name EM comes from. And we will arrive at that by maybe asking a preliminary question, which is what actually is the nature of these variables R, these responsibilities, of individual clusters for individual data. How can we think about this responsibility? Where, what, what kind of variable is this? Now it turns out that um, a very interesting interpretation arises if we change our notation a little bit. If we go back to our Gaussian mixture model, which has so far the parameters mu, sigma, pi, and we introduce a new auxiliary helper variable. Let's call that variable z, and let's interpret it as the hard assignment of an individual datum to a particular cluster. So this is an intermediate variable that we can use to generate the data set. To generate the data set, we first draw cluster assignments for each of the data, and then for each datum, draw the instance of the datum by drawing a Gaussian random variable from this particular cluster. You'll notice a, that this gets us closer to the idea of k-means because k-means directly assigns a value to these z variables in a hard fashion, ignoring pi. So that's another way of thinking about what k-means does as a kind of a maximum likelihood assignment to the zi. And it also, of course, reminds us immediately of our topic model where we had a similar kind of structure. We introduced the word topic assignments c di, right, um, which were just like this set here. They are the variables that if only we had those, then we were able to uh, do efficient inference on all the parameters of the model. So here, let's do this a little bit, let's take a step back and do this more, a little bit more precisely. Um, we will consider these binary variables uh, z, i, j, which are providing a one-hot encoding, so that means they are all zero except for one of the entries along the j direction. Um, which identifies the class, the cluster that the uh, element belongs to, that the data set, the datum belongs to. So once we introduce this variable, our notation uh, uh, conveniently can be updated a little bit. So we first notice that the marginal probability, or maybe the prior probability, for 
the jth entry for data point i to be the one that is switched on is exactly given by pi j. So this prior distribution has a very simple form. We can also use this simple uh, this notation z to write the joint over all of the z's in a very efficient way as a double product independent over all the individual data points and as a product over the individual entries in pi j to the power, raised to the power of zij, which is convenient because the zij are binary variables, so all but one of the entries is zero. So that's like writing, it's the probability over, uh, it's the product over all the individual data points times the probability for the one cluster that that one datum belongs to. The generative probability for the instances xi, the individual data points, given these cluster identities can also very efficiently be written as, or given the entire set z, let's do that directly, as a product over all the individual cluster probabilities, like the generative probabilities for each cluster, Gaussian distributions, raised to the power of these zij. So we can write the joint probability, so the joint conditional probability for all the xi um, as a product over all the individual data times a product over all the cluster probabilities raised to this power. And in particular, this allows us to write the um, marginal probability for the xi themselves, the Gaussian mixture probability, as um, just using the structure of the um, graphical model as the probability for, as a, as a marginal probability, right? A marginal probability for x by taking the joint over x and z and summing out z. So the joint over x and z can be written by the product rule as the probability for x given z times the probability for z. And those two terms are exactly the bits that we've seen in our Gaussian mixture model so far. It's the probability for z, it's just pi, times the probability for um, x given z, which is this Gaussian distribution, uh, Gaussian probability evaluated at um, the particular value of z where this name EM algorithm comes from begins to become clearer when we now look at the joint probability distribution for X, the data we see, and the latent unknown variable Z. Notice that here in this graphical model, I've already made this a little bit clearer. We, can, um, we, we are going to do maximum likelihood inference, so we are, I, I've written little black dots for these parameters, mu, pi, and sigma, so these are the the variables that we're not going to assign a probability distribution over. But let's assume that we would like to do inference on z, on the unknown variable that is actually just a helper variable. Then you could consider to do Bayesian inference the joint distribution for x and z that will give us the numerator of Bayes' theorem. If we write that down, then we can use this notation I just introduced on the previous slide to um, write the joint probability for x and z given pi, mu, and sigma as, the, as this, right? So that's the probability for um, z given pi, mu, and sigma, which is just the probability for z given pi by this graph, times the probability for x given z and pi, mu, and sigma. And we can use this joint to compute the conditional distribution for the z's, the posterior, if you like, for z, given the latent variables. That's the joint, or the prior times the likelihood, divided by the normalization constant, the evidence, which is the joint marginalized over z. And we've just done that on the previous slide, but notice that this term up here is given by, you know, the probability for z, which is pi, times the probability for x given z, which is the cluster probability, and the, the probability for x under this particular cluster um, element, divided by the sum of all of these terms. Well, that's exactly our responsibility. It's exactly this rij variable that we've encountered in um, the, the previous derivations. So what is that variable? Well, it's the probability the discrete probability to choose this particular instance of z. Or another way of thinking about this is that because this is a discrete distribution, this p, those values, rij, those are actually the expected 
values for the value of z, right? It's the expected value of z. That's, yeah, because the expected value under a discrete distribution is just the probability uh, of for each individual variable. So one way of thinking very specifically about what our version of maximum likelihood k-means or soft k-means does is that it iterates back and forth between computing the expected value of this latent quantity z, then setting z to that value and using that particular value to maximize the probability for mu and pi and sigma. Here is on this slide again. Let me just say that again. Our pseudocode version for our um, maximum likelihood estimate for a Gaussian mixture model is to randomize initially for the um, uh, parameters of the, of the mixture model and then iterate between computing the expected value of the latent unknown label assignment variable z that amounts to computing the responsibilities rij and maximizing the likelihood for the parameters of the model. The parameters are mu and sigma and pi. And that's why this algorithm is called the expectation maximization algorithm because it iterates between computing an expectation and maximizing a likelihood. Another way of thinking about this algorithm, and I always never quite know whether this is really helpful or not, so see if it helps you or doesn't help, is that this algorithm um, kind of tries to invent as much as possible a value for this latent uh, quantity z. So one way to describe what's happening here is that we have this directed graphical model, this generative model, which has this latent variable z. We don't know what z is. If we knew what it was, if we could color it in black, then it would be easy because then this whole graph gets sort of neatly separated. We know how to infer pi if you know z, and we know how to set mu and sigma if jointly, if we um, know x and, uh, and z. So we don't know what z is, so what EM does is it iterates between not actually in a hard way setting z to a particular value, but computing the expected value of z, and then using this expected value of z to, um, and the structure of this graph to then estimate mu and pi and sigma in a maximum likelihood fashion, and then the other way around, keeping those values for mu and pi and sigma to compute the expected value of z. Now, you notice that this graph has a similar structure to the more, slightly more complicated one we've noticed in our topic models, and I've already mentioned now several times that we are going to add this algorithm, the EM algorithm, to our toolbox. It will become the, well, actually the penultimate tool in our toolbox. The ultimate one will be a generalization of the EM algorithm that is called variational approximations. But actually it's useful to think of both of them as separate kind of aspects of, the, of a very similar related idea. So, We've now just derived EM in a kind of pedestrian fashion in an like a, a, a slow progression for one concrete model for Gaussian mixture models. What I'd like to conclude this lecture with is to, is, is, uh, to take this particular specific algorithm and just tell you the story again, the story of this algorithm, but in a more abstract, on a more abstract level. Like go one level up on the hierarchy of like, con concepts and they go away from Gaussian mixture models and talk about EM again so that we can find the structure that really we're really leveraging here when we're constructing this algorithm. That'll help us understand how we can apply this tool, really, this algorithm really as a tool in more general settings like, for example, our topic model. As a general tool, EM is an idea, an algorithmic concept, that you might want to try in situations where you want to compute a maximum likelihood estimate, or actually also a maximum a posteriori estimate, we'll see that that's not particularly more challenging, in models where you can't directly compute maximum likelihood estimates. So there is a, a P of X given theta, a maximum likelihood type problem. We want to find the maximal value, the, the value for theta that maximizes this expression, or in particular also the log of this expression, but we can't do this in closed form. If you could, then we would just do just that. Now, there, there are sometimes situations, and this is when EM applies, where you can invent 
a latent variable z such that this log likelihood can be written as the log over the marginal of the joint. Well, of course, that everything can always be written like this because this is just the, the, the product rule. But this special, special aspect of this variable z is that when we introduce it, the optimization becomes easy or would become easy if we knew z. So another way of phrasing this is EM is an algorithm that works in models where you want to do maximum likelihood and there is a latent variable z that you don't know but if you knew it everything would be easy. If you knew it the optimization would be easy. The idea or the structure of EM then is to initialize the estimate for the optimization with a particular value for the latent parameters th uh, theta and compute the conditional distribution, the predictive distribution for these informative latent quantities z, um, given the data and this particular parameter value theta. And then, and this is a somewhat mouthful of a sentence, set the parameter estimate theta to a new estimate that is given by the maximum, by the location of the maximum of the expectation of the so-called complete data log likelihood, where the complete data log likelihood is the joint, the distribution for both the data and the latent variable z. So why is this a good idea? Well, it's a good idea because we had now have an optimized, instead of having to optimize a function without the, the z here, which we don't know how to optimize, we now have a sum over a bunch of terms which we know how to optimize. So our assumption was that this function is easy to optimize for a particular value of z, and we now have a sum, uh, typically a convex combination, well not just typically, a convex combination because these are all positive numbers, of um, such terms that are easy to optimize, and those may be way easier to optimize than the original function. Another question you may have is whether, our, why this is, why I'm talking about this as a general tool, why can we hope that such situations are frequent? Well, that's not immediately clear, but maybe it helps to understand that you get to set what those variable z's are. So you get to invent what z is, right? We can always, for any variable z, write this um, expansion because it's just a sum rule. So you could imagine that maybe there are quite frequent cases where you can invent an explanatory variable z that typically decouples things from each other so that they become easier. So this is the abstract generic representation of the EM algorithm. Maximize the expected value of the complete data log likelihood at a particular value in, in uh, the parameters and then keep iterating um, by uh, like close to iteration by assigning the computing the expected value or the probability distribution for the latent quantity. How does this relate to um, our situation in, in uh, Gaussian mixture models. So just let's make this connection again and see how our way of doing iterative maximum likelihood for the Gaussian mixture model looks like from the point of view of this uh, abstract representation. So here is our graphical model again for our Gaussian mixture model. We wanted to do maximum likelihood inference on this model, so that's our probability distribution for the data given the parameters, which are given by pi, mu, and sigma. And that log likelihood is exactly of this form that it's, although it's iid over the individual data points, xi, each of these iid terms contains in the log a sum over individual terms. So log of a sum is hard to optimize in closed form, it would be nicer if there were a product here because then those expressions are easy to maximize in mu and sigma and actually also in pi. So what we do is we introduce this latent quantity z, this explanatory variable that tells us which cluster each individual datum is supposed to, be, to belong to. Well, it would tell us if we would know it. We notice that when we introduce this, um, this variable, that the structure of our problem gets easier. And now we, we saw that this, like, we can turn our sum into basically a product. This seemed like a sort of a 
accidental neat thing in our notation, but it's actually a really powerful thing. Instead of having to write the log over a sum, we now get to write the, um, basically the log over the product where we can write the individual terms and the sum as a product over these terms raised to the power of this explanatory variable z, which is binary, right? So only one of them is one. Because we have a product now in here, we can basically take the log inside, right? And the, both of these products just turn into sums where the z and k come down. And we have terms here that are easy to optimize. Actually, one of the reasons they are easy to optimize is that these are exponential family distributions. They are a discrete distribution that's an exponential family, and the Gaussian distribution, which is an exponential family. And we know that finding the, the uh, maximum likelihood hyperparameters for exponential families, here mu and sigma and pi, is possible because it can be done by just computing the gradient of the normalization constant and setting it to zero. That's actually what we've been doing in these derivations. It's sort of, we just did it explicitly, but actually we computed gradients of normalization constants. So these expressions are easy to optimize and we want to do that. The only problem we have is that by introducing our latent variable z, we have that z now lying around somewhere in our computation. So the idea of EM is to, um, is to compute the expected value of this expression under z. That's just another sum over the, the values for, uh, for uh, z. And um, just optimize that function instead. And because it's, it's going to be a sum over functions that are easy to optimize, that is actually, well, we hope that it's easy and it turns out that it is easy. That's exactly what we did. So we iterated between writing down the conditional distribution, the predictive distribution for this explanatory variable z. We did this and noticed that it gives us these quantities that we call responsibilities. These are just a bunch of terms. And because it's a discrete distribution, it actually isn't, a big problem that these are somewhat kind of onerous, complicated terms because they are just numbers that we can compute and we can call them the responsibilities. And then maximize this expected complete data log likelihood, this expression, which is a sum over individual terms weighted by the responsibilities where each individual term is easy to maximize, or it has a simple gradient that is easy to maximize. And so we found that each individual term is actually uh, it's easy to set this sum to uh, zero as well and solve for it because it's just a linear combination of easy to maximize terms. Yeah, and with that, we've actually arrived at an early end of today's lecture. Why are the detour of k-means and Gaussian mixture models and our manual derivation of a maximum likelihood estimate, an iterative maximum likelihood estimate for these types of models, we have arrived at a relatively generic algorithm called the EM algorithm or the expectation maximization algorithm. It's an algorithm for iterative numerical optimization or, or the construction of maximum likelihood or in fact also maximum a posteriori estimates that essentially leverages the power of the sum rule. The fact that probabilistic models can always be expanded with latent variables can be used in the hope of finding a particular choice of latent variables such that the individual terms in the sum rule then become easy to optimize or that their log becomes easy to optimize. The EM algorithm works as follows. We're in a situation where we would like to compute a maximum likelihood estimate for this probability distribution, whatever it may be, but we don't have a closed form estimate for it. However, we might be able to invent a latent variable z, an explanatory variable, such that this so-called complete data log likelihood, so if the log were inside of the sum, are actually easy to optimize. In such situations, instead of optimizing this expression, we can instead iterate between initializing with a particular value of theta, then um, computing P of z, the explanatory variable, given x and theta, so computing the predictive distribution for z, and then computing the expected value of the complete log likelihood and maximizing it as a function of theta. Then we recompute the probability, the conditional probability distribution for z, so the predictive distribution for z, 
recompute the com expected complete data log likelihood, maximize again, and iterate this process over and over again until we reach a point where the algorithm converges at a particular value of theta. Perhaps the next thing we might want to try is to apply the CM algorithm to our topic model. But actually, before we do that, in the next lecture, we will pause for a moment at EM and first try and understand why this algorithm actually converges and try to confirm to ourselves that it actually does converge at the maximum likelihood estimate and not somewhere else. When we do that, we'll discover that there is an opportunity to actually generalize the EM algorithm even further. And what we'll get out of that is a very powerful algorithmic notion for approximate probabilistic inference called variational inference. But that's the content for the next lecture. For today, let's keep it at this. Thank you very much for your attention. See you in the next lecture.